Welcome back to Vintage Camera Digest. I'm Stephen Broom, and today we're looking back at 1959 and the Ricoh Matic 225, a somewhat underrated TLR from Ricoh, so stay tuned. Ricoh Optical Industries began producing cameras as far back as 1939. And prior to that, they were involved in various photographic endeavors back to around 1920. And over 100 years later, they're still one of the major players in photography. During the past century, they've produced a lot of different cameras in various formats, including 120 and 127, 35 millimeter, 16 millimeter, 110, and even 126. Their first twin lens reflex, or TLR, was the Ricoflex Model B in 1941. And as far as I'm aware, there was no Model A. This unusual naming convention was continued by Ricoh on some of their other cameras. For example, there were no Ricoflex models 1, 2, or 5, but there were models 3, 4, 6, and 7. So if you've been looking around for a Ricoh TLR and never see a Model A, that's why. I guess you could say that that model is extremely rare. As in so rare it doesn't exist. But anyway, the camera I want to look at today is the Ricomatic 225 from 1959. And from what I can tell, it was the last 6x6 format TLR from Ricoh. The camera uses 120 film for 12 exposures on a roll. And unlike later medium format cameras, though, it can't use 220. It has a built-in uncoupled selenium meter. And the one in this camera still responds to light and unbelievably is still accurate within a stop. Still, just to be safe, when we take this out, I'll plan on using my spot meter like usual to determine exposures. Uh, the metering system uses the light value scale to determine exposure. And I think the light value system makes a lot of sense because it's great at teaching the relationship between shutter speed and f-stop. To use the meter, the first thing you'll need to do is to set the film speed. The range of speeds is ASA 6 to 800. Then you just point your camera at the subject and take note of the light value number that the meter is showing. If the meter needle doesn't move, you can open the meter cover on the front of the camera by pressing the little silver button. Then reset the meter knob by pulling up and changing it from closed to open. In practical use, you'll probably leave the meter cover closed when outdoors and open when indoors. But again, take note of the light value number that the needle points to. And in this case, we're looking at a light value of 10. Then to set the shutter speed and f-stop using the light value number, Turn the shutter speed adjustment lever until the corresponding light value number shows up in the window. All right, and that was 10. All right, then you turn the f-stop adjustment lever on this side until the yellow mark, which is near f8, aligns with the light value number given on the exposure meter. This gives you a base shutter speed f-stop combination. If you need a faster or slower speed, depending on subject movement or a different f-stop to give you a different depth of field, just adjust the shutter speed lever until your desired setting is in the exposure window. Since we use that light value number to link the two settings of f-stop and shutter speed, every adjustment keeps the same exposure since they're still linked. If you move the aperture lever by accident though, the two values will become unlinked and you'll need to reset the light value. One other thing to note is that when the viewfinder hood is closed, the shutter release is locked. So you don't have to worry about accidentally tripping the shutter when you don't mean to. Now loading film is a bit different with the 225. The film path is from top to bottom instead of the usual bottom to top. So make sure your take-up spool is in the bottom position. To open the back, we'll just move the latch lever in the direction of the arrow, then flip up the locking tab and we'll open the back. Next, we'll put our unexposed roll of film in the top chamber. Then pull the paper and engage the spool at the bottom. They're gonna wind the crank clockwise until the start mark lines up with the start mark in the camera. And we'll close the back and lock. We're going to wind on. The crank will automatically stop when you reach the first frame. After the crank stops, rotate it back counterclockwise until it stops again. And now you're ready to shoot. 
Perfect. Another interesting feature of the 225 are the focus levers instead of a focusing knob. There's a lever on each side of the lens board in a perfect spot to reach with your thumbs while holding the camera. Very clever. And yet another unique feature for a camera of this era is an actual hot shoe. The taking lens is a Reconon 80mm 3.5 consisting of four elements in three groups and it has bayonet one mount so there are plenty of filters, hoods, and auxiliary attachments that will fit it. The shutter is a Seikosha SLV with speeds from 1 500th of a second down to one second and the shutter is cocked during film advance. One final thing to mention about the 225 is that an accessory was available that lets you shoot 35mm in this camera. This would have been especially helpful for color transparencies since transparency film in 120 size wasn't quite common in 1959 if it even existed. All in all, it's quite a simple camera. Uh, so let's take it out for a shoot. We're here at this nice little covered bridge. It's gonna at least shoot one roll here, uh, maybe two. I've got some Ektar 100 in here. Uh, going with color again for a change. Uh, you know, I like to keep it spiced up. All right, so I am going to meter off the roof of the covered bridge as my highlight and the bark of this tree well maybe actually i will also meter the shadow area in there inside the bridge all right so i'm gonna this is the old minolta spot meter again so i'm gonna meter a highlight area and a shadow area and then average the two all right so my metering is the roof of the covered bridge all right, let's put that in the memory. And my shadow area is gonna be inside. Put that in the memory and then average. And it's telling me, oof, time at 1 60th of a second. Let's slow this down to, let's go to 1 15th of a second at F8. That should give me the same thing. All right, 1 15th of a second at F8. That's why I have this thing on a tripod today. Making sure I am level. I'm pretty level here. All right, top is up. And let's go for an exposure here. So I've moved in a little closer. I'm not gonna be able to get the entire bridge in this particular photo, but I'm gonna get this in, but there's a little path that winds off into the woods and there's a little clearing where we can see a little bright spot through there. Uh, you may not be able to see it on this super wide angle on the GoPro, but got it in the camera. Again, I'm gonna meter the roof of the bridge as the highlight and the interior shadow area as the shadow. Clear memory here. Still have this set at 1 15th of a second. All right, so highlight, memory, shadow, memory, average that and it's going to give me f11 at 1 15th of a second let's do f8 then at 1 30th of a second all right there we go let's look at focus one more time all right These things are so quiet, it's almost like you don't take a picture. You know, you're used to hearing the click of the mirror and the wind of the film. Range finders and TLRs are almost, I mean, you almost question yourself, are they actually even working? We just got some sun, so I'm going to hurry up and make a shot. Highlight. Oh, let's increase the time to 160th of a second. All right, highlight. Shadow. Average. 160 at F8 and a half. Okay, let's do it. Oh, that's quiet. All right, we're gonna do another one of these just to make sure. 1 60th of a second at F8 and a half. And these waist level finders have a lot of glare coming in from the side. 
All right, so at least I got two shots off while the sun was out. All right, so I've been spending the last several minutes looking for a, another angle for this. Um, so I'm gonna try this. I'm gonna drop my shutter speed to 1 15th of a second again. Clear the memory. So I've got, so I've got my highlight here in the gravel. And again, the shadows are gonna be right inside the bridge. All right, so highlight reading, shadow reading. That gives me 1 15th of a second at 5.6. Now the cool thing about this camera is that I can focus with either hand because the focusing levers are on both sides of the lens so while I am shading the viewfinder with my right hand so that I can see I can focus with the left which is handy all right so I said 5.6 I don't know that's going to give me the depth of field I want so let's do 1 8th of a second at f8 all right started to rain a little bit even though there was no rain in the forecast. So I am taking cover inside the bridge for a little bit. Maybe this will pass quickly. So while I'm under cover of the bridge, uh, make the most of this time and do a little shot right over here with this bench, with this nice geometrical pattern in the back. Hopefully I can get some symmetry out of that. This viewfinder is fairly dark, so it's hard to see in here. So uh, we do the best we can though. There's really no highlight and shadow area in this. It's all fairly mid gray. So let's just see if I take a reading. All right. F2 at 1 8th of a second. All right, well, that's not gonna work, so. I need F3.5. All right, so that's half. That's going to give me F4 at one half of a second. F4 at one half of a second. All right, let's see. I'm going to have to get out my light just so I can see what I'm doing. Half second at F4. I don't have a cable release, so I'll hold my breath. Okay, and the brain may have stopped. Yes, I believe so. See, that was a valuable use of time. So the rain showers passed, got a little chilly, I had to go get my jacket. Um, so I've got this little bird feeder here, a uh, birdhouse. And I'm fairly close to it with this TLR, probably about as close as I can be. Uh, so I'm gonna try shooting this wide open and then stop down a little bit just to see what the difference is. So, when you set a shutter speed f-stop combination on this camera, the shutter speed and f-stop rings lock together. So you can move the shutter speed now and that same f-stop, that same exposure moves. So I didn't have to reset anything other than the shutter speed. So that and, and it helps keep things straight. All right, so for this, I'm just going to follow this path. Maybe this path will like lead our eyes into the scene. These branches that are hanging over the road a bit. That's a nice color. Or a yeah, decent color. Alright, we still have some hydrangeas sporting some color. So, 
shoot wide open, shallow depth of field. I don't really have a definite highlight in shadow. So I'm going to meter off of one of these leaves. I think that's going to be close to a middle gray. Right, F four and a half at 60. Okay, let's see. All right. Feels like there is some gearing that's not catching. So I don't know if anything is wound or not. So I wanted to get another roll shot, but uh, we may have a broken camera. I'm afraid to open the back of the camera in case the film has not wound. Well, I hope this shoot wasn't a disaster because there are some shots that I really thought were gonna work out. Ugh, all right. Well, we'll just have to see what happens. Well, I don't know about you, but I'm tired of breaking cameras. First, it was the Nikon N2020, although technically I did fix that, but now the winding mechanism on this. But I guess that's par for the course when we're dealing with a 50-year-old camera. But still, I hate it, mostly because I really like this camera. Fortunately, I do have another one of these that has a shutter issue, so maybe between the two of them I can get one working correctly. Anyway. The photos turned out decently, I think. I don't know if there are any I'd frame and hang on the wall, but they were nice. I think my favorite shot was the one taken inside the bridge while we were waiting on the rain to stop, and maybe the one with the bird feeder. I would have liked to have kept going with another roll of film, but yeah. But I don't want to end this episode on a down note. The positive takeaway from all of this is that the Ricoh Matic 225 is a pretty good camera. It's very, very similar to a Yashica mat. It handles quite the same, but it has some additional refinements like the hot shoe and the light value exposure system. And with this particular camera, the ability to shoot 35 millimeter film, although the Yashica 635 allowed 35 millimeter shooting as well. Well, that about wraps it up for this episode. And as always, I'd love to hear what you have to say. So be sure to leave a comment. If you've enjoyed the video, please hit the thumbs up and consider subscribing to the channel. Got a lot more in the works. You know, this camera came out in 1959, and that year, I think, was a watershed year in photography. It was a turning point that set the course of photography that has led us to the present day. I have a class of 59 series plan where we'll do a deep dive on some of the most important camera landmarks of that year. So again, be sure to subscribe so you don't miss it. And as always, thanks for doing what you do to keep film photography alive and well. I'll see you next time. <music>